hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast that's called Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, sometimes even the future. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. Some of you might know my other Beatles program, which is a syndicated radio show, music show on the Beatles, called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts, first of all. A busy man who writes more Beatle news than anybody else, and he writes for Axis.com, AXS.com, for Billboard.com, for Variety.com, and no doubt others, and uh, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have our musicologist who writes for Beatle Fan Magazine, also for the Wall Street Journal for many years with the New York Times and their classical department. And he's authored a number of Beatle books, including From the Cavern to the Rooftop and also Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to be uh, talking about the brand new album from Ringo Starr called Give More Love, which is due out on uh, this coming Friday, September the 15th. We're doing this show on the 11th. And we're also going to uh, play uh, clips from an interview that Steve did with Giles Martin when the uh, remix for Sgt. Pepper and the box set came out. And that will be towards the end of the show. Uh, before we get to uh, our main topic there about Ringo, we do have some... Uh, some news items to get to. And Steve, you want to let the folks know about uh, some information you found out about the Beatles receiving two Emmy Awards. Well, over the weekend, the Beatles, uh, they, they gave out the Creative um, Arts uh, Emmy Awards. And Eight Days a Week won two of them. The Outstanding Nonfiction Sound Editing and Outstanding Nonfiction Sound Mixing. And I know Mr. Cozen has a comment about that. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. I mean, when we talked about the film, we got into the fact that they substituted the soundtrack of the Manchester 1963 performances mm -hmm. with Hollywood Bowl soundtrack um, from like two years later. And so it just seems bizarre to me that someone can win an award for nonfiction sound editing and nonfiction video editing because they turned nonfiction clips into fiction. You know, because what you see and what you hear is not what happened. I mean, what you see is what happened, and what you hear is what happened two years later, halfway around the world. That to me is fiction. You know, I mean, okay, they played them similarly and they synced it up well and all of that, but it now is, you know, to call it nonfiction and to give it an award for nonfiction is just insane to me. But this is the world we live in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to argue with that. Mm. <laughs> I'm so persuasive. <laughs> you are. You are. All right. Uh, anything else you want to say about the Emmys there, Steve? Do you just uh, do you agree with Alan's point of view? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've talked about that enough here. And, yeah, I, under, I understand how he feels. And I, you wonder, you know, what what criteria they they use to, to give it to him. But, hey, well, you know, we're, I, I'm not a – I'm not in the uh, Emmy uh, – I'm not an Emmy voter, so I – you know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, always happy to see the Beatles get awards, you know? I mean, that part is great, but it's just that these awards make no sense for what they're awards for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have some news about Danny Harrison, who, as you know, has a brand new album coming out called In Parallel, which is due out on October the 6th. And he actually announced last week that he'll be doing a brief U.S. tour. And it actually starts, it starts on November the 6th when he plays in New York City at the Knitting Factory. And it will end on November the 30th uh, at the El Rey Theater in Los Angeles. It's a total of uh, seven shows. He'll also have a supporting act, um, an act called Summer Moon, which will be on the first two dates. And there's another act, Mareki, M-E-R-E-K-I, on the other five shows. 
So um, if you look at dannyharrison.com, all seven dates are listed there if you're interested in seeing Danny. Okay. And if you pre-order yeah. the album, you get one of the tracks as a download now. Right. Do you know which one? Uh, I think it was the one that they had a few weeks ago. It's the same one. All, I can't remember. It's all about waiting. All yeah. about waiting. Right. Yeah. Good um, song. And they also I went on the site because I pre-ordered it. And um, they have, you know, all kinds of different packages you can buy. I mean, this is this is the way things are marketed now. And it's kind of interesting if you... You know, if you want, you can get just the CD or just the download or the CD in a T-shirt or the CD in a poster or the LP in a poster. The posters are signed, apparently, um, mm. and buttons and all kinds of other trinkets and that kind of thing. So it, it's, it, it looks like, you know, they're making it fun. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. that's a good thing. I'm sure some of his fans would like to have t-shirts and buttons and stuff like that posters. yeah you know and the track is good and we've heard what he's done over the years with the new number two and you know other things that he's been involved in and um i i have you know high hopes for the album i mean he's a good musician thoughtful musician mm-hmm. right i'm curious how how his solo career will be different than the new number two that's what i'm kind of interested in it so far the the new track is not that far away from the new number two and i'm i'm curious if there's going to be a little diversity yeah. on the rest of the album but yeah. well he was so like we'll 50 percent he was like 50 percent of the new number two so it's i don't know how different right. it's going to be either you know well that's true i mean that's true too but and you know so and i'm curious as to yeah, I'm sure he'll do an interview probably with Rolling Stone at some point. I'm curious as to why the new number two dissolved and why he decided to do the solo route. But maybe we'll find that answer out uh, before too long. Mm-hmm. I'm so. sure we will. You know, that's yep. that's an obvious question right. to ask him. Well, speaking of Harrison's, uh, you might recall that last week we talked about a recording that was up for auction from Omega Auctions. And it was said to be a George Harrison recording, and we were debating whether or not it was or not, and we do have some information that the recording itself sold. And maybe, Steve, you can let us know all the information you have on that. Well, what I, what I was told by somebody who watched the auction online this morning was that it sold for 14,000 pounds, which comes out to 18,005 U.S. dollars without the buyer's premium so actually the the final price will be higher but um the i mean the big question here is what apparently some beatles scholars including john Wynn, was and was one of them came up with that it had some links to donovan and it sounded a lot like the song peregrine p-e-r-e-g-r-i-n-e that uh, i guess is on donovan's hurdy gurdy man album and it's it's on you the song is on youtube but anyway, that's the that's the song, and apparently that this has any link to if it does. But the Harrison the whole package would also also included a, I guess some other songs, uh, Beatles songs uh, sold for eighteen thousand dollars today. So yeah, that's that, that's we, about it. We've all heard this very short excerpt, which is only six seconds long, mm-hmm. and to my ears, it certainly sounds like George. Well, yeah, I hadn't heard it last week, and I think there was some doubt among us last week. And Alan, you were saying you thought it was a different. There was a different clip, which is interesting. I don't know. I didn't hear the one that um, that you guys heard today. So uh, uh, what I heard, you absolutely couldn't tell anything about anything from. Okay, hmm. I had a, a little impression that it was George, but it wasn't. A, it wasn't one of these. You know, override. It wasn't one of these. Yeah, definitely sure things. Right. Um, so you know, there's still maybe some question as to whether it's him, but somebody thought it was him. So, and we don't know. And it'd be interesting to see if we can find out who it was. That it, especially if it was the Harrison estate, that would be interesting. So. Well, we need to get the full story behind this recording because we don't know if it's something that. That maybe Donovan wrote, and maybe George wrote his own lyrics to Donovan's melody. Uh, you know, I have have you compared <laughs> as much as you can with six seconds of a song? 
Uh, no, I didn't. I, I didn't do any. I didn't do yeah. any comparisons because I because yeah. because the the link with the the Donovan song is so tentative that mm. it's just kind of a guess. Um, right. But I don't. You know. I don't know. But well, hopefully, at some point, we'll have a definitive word on this. Hopefully. Hmm. Okay. And then, Steve, you wanted to talk about a documentary that you just saw, which uh, we read your your review of. Well, um, they, uh, it was 50 years ago today, uh, The Beatles and The Making of Sgt. Pepper came out this week on DVD in America. It's been out, I guess, in England for a while. I reviewed it for Access, and, and I have to say, I was, it was, really, I was really underwhelmed. Um, it's another one of these unauthorized Beatles documentaries. I mean, they, they made a big deal out of it, like it was, like was kind of authorized, but it wasn't. And so there's a lot of interviews with people that that you will have seen before. Tony Bramwell, Julia Baird, um, Bill Harry's in it, Hunter Davies is in it, Frida Kelly is in it, Ray Connolly, Phil Norman, Steve Turner, Brian Epstein's secretary, Barbara O'Donnell. And, but uh, there is some archival interviews with others, including um, the Beatles themselves. The one standout thing that I mentioned in the interview that I thought was really was interesting and may you know have some interest for for, uh, for people is that a lot of the archival footage is um, is longer than normal uh, they uh, the director sent me a note this week that they had worked really hard to get some of this stuff and that it had not been some of it had not been seen since it was originally broadcast. The archival producer on this is Keith um, Badman, whose name a lot of people will know from his Beatles reference books and excellent reference books. But uh, for that reason, there is some interesting footage in there that you will not have seen. The uh, U.S. set also includes a second set of bonus features that has a tour of Beatles sites, uh, that has interviews with Julia Baird and Pete Best, and also has an interview with Andy Peebles, which I was quite critical of because he talks about double fantasy and why Andy Peebles is talking about double fantasy in a in a documentary about Sgt. Pepper is beyond me. And not only does he say that double fantasy is not one of Lennon's most spectacular albums, which I think it is, um, he also has some negative comments about Yoko Ono, and I'm and I thought, and I said in my interview or in my review that it was very much out of place to put people's comments. We've we've heard people's comments before. He wrote a, or there was a very negative profile of Yoko Ono that, uh, based on his comments several years ago in one of the tabloids. But why this is here, I have no idea, uh, and, and I think that it really doesn't belong. So. If you're if you're interested in seeing, uh, it was 50 years ago today. The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, and Beyond. Be aware that it's not authorized. It doesn't have any Beatles music. Not one note of Beatles music. There are no living Beatles in in the uh, film. There's no comments from them. And on that basis, I really don't think it's all that much to get excited about. So. With all the people, there. that roster of people that you mentioned there that were interviewed, you don't find the interviews to be at all interesting, or is there anything that you learned? A lot of the of I mean, a lot of the stuff is the same stuff over and over again. I mean, you know, I mean, it's nice to see Frida Kelly. Frida Kelly always has, you know, Frida Kelly may be one of the bright spots in 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 it. You know, Hunter Davies talks about Brian Epstein's sexual habits. I'm not joking there. <laughs> So, I mean, there's a lot of junk. It's not as bad as some... Uh, there's one... Um, I can't remember the name of it. One unauthorized Beatles uh, documentary that came out several years ago that was nothing but trash. You know, trash talk and gossip. You know, more like T, uh, TMZ type of thing. This is not that, thank God. But the fact that Hunter Davies goes off to where he does and... and um, that uh, uh, Andy Peebles does what he does, it just takes away from it. And, uh, I, I, you know, I'm sorry that that's the case. It almost uh, sounds like they didn't have enough material, so they had to pad it with 
unrelated material, really. Well, like I said, the Andy Peebles thing is in the special features. It's not in the it's not in the film. Okay. And the, 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 it's surprising that Pete Best is not in the film. Pete Best is also in the special features, and I don't get that either. But you know, it's it's just another unauthorized documentary of which there have been many and many over the years. Mm-hmm. So, okay, just cashing in on the anniversary. That's all. That's yeah. what, that was what I said, and and that was one thing the director told me in a in a message this week that they weren't doing, but. That's all you can really, you know, that's all you can really say. I mean, because the Beatles didn't do a 50th anniversary Sgt. Pepper documentary. This is it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Well, Alan, you want to say anything? Um, well, I haven't seen it. So, yeah. um It doesn't seem like um, something particularly appealing. I, I, I probably will get a copy for the shelf. But, um, yeah, it doesn't sound like something you'd want to spend a lot of time with. Yeah. I haven't seen it either, but I am curious I don't really want to make a judgment call without seeing it myself. So, but, uh, you know, there you go. All right. Our uh, main topic on the show this time is Ringo Starr's new album called Give More Love. This is actually, believe it or not, Ringo's 19th studio album in his solo career. It's coming out September 15th. There's 10 original songs on there. And plus, there are four cover versions of uh, older songs from Ringo's catalog, including Don't Pass Me By on there, uh, Back Off Boogaloo, Photograph, and You Can't Fight Lightning. So uh, I'm going to get each of your opinions on this album, and we'll start with Steve. I really I really like it. I think it's, uh, I mean, it seems like every time Ringo comes around with a new album, you know, I listen to it and I really like it and it kind of falls away after a while and I don't know what's going to happen with this one. But I, I have enjoyed, I mean, they sent out promo copies a couple of months ago, so I've been listening to this for a while and I really like it. I mean, it's, it, it's, I enjoy it. Uh, it kicks off uh, with "We're on the Road Again," which I, which is a fantastic song, mm-hmm. a fantastic song. I, I adore that song, and uh, and McCartney's "Screams" are the cherry on top. But it's such a great rocker. I mean, so many of the songs are great. Uh, I, I like uh, "Show Me the Way" because it's got, uh, um, uh, you know, it's a, a cute song about Barbara. Uh, I like speed of sound because it, because it's got uh, the old uh, uh, Peter Frampton coming in with the with the talk box. I, I, I you know he's done that so many times. Uh, I, I like uh, uh, electricity. That's a great tribute to uh, Johnny Byrne, uh, Johnny Guitar of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Mm-hmm. Um, so wrong for so long is a is another song that that really gives you the feeling that Bokua Blues wasn't as wacky as it seemed back in 1970. Um, and one thing, one thing throughout the whole album that is really kind of surprising to say is that Ringo's voice has improved with age. He sounds fantastic on this album. Mm-hmm. I don't know what he's, what he's doing, but he just sounds great. Shake It Up is another great song, another great rock and roll song. I, I love the remakes. Back Off Boogaloo especially because it has both feet in the pa- present and the past. And it's got a great slide guitar by Joe Walsh. Apparently, had... they, they actually mixed the one of the original recordings that Ringo made for Back right. Off Boogaloo into the new version. Well, uh, yeah, that's what that's what David Wilde's uh, comments that we received with the with the album said. And and I really I I I, I actually wonder if George Harrison is in there somewhere. But uh, you know, it, it's such a it's a great version. I really like it. Mm-hmm. I like uh, "Don't Pass Me By." It's uh, it's not that far off from the original, but I love it. "Can't Fight Lightning" is probably the only forgettable track on the album. Um, I'm not that big of a it's it, it compared to the others. Uh, it's just not an attention grabber. "Photograph" is a great song, and I love the version that he did. And I like the uh, harmony vocal by Rose Garin on the on the song. 
But, uh, I mean, overall, I think this is a, a, an, an excellent album. I think it's a great album. I think people will, will really love it. If, if I had to be critical of it, I think the lyrics in a couple of spots fall down. Um, I think, where is it? Um, looking at my notes. The song where he mentions Haile, Haile Selassie. I, I uh, King, King of the Kingdom. Of the kingdom. Uh-huh. I'm going. What the? Why is Haile Selassie mentioned in this song? I still don't know. And I wonder how many people are gonna are gonna go through and Google who the hell Haile Selassie is. I mean, it's a great reggae song. Although I, I think I wish it had been a little more reggae than it was. I think it would have been even better. But I think overall the album is great. And lyrically, I think uh, you know, ex- except for instances like that i think it, you know it's it's really good i think the one thing about ringo's albums that are are uh, have been really good the past few years is the playing is the the studio work he really puts a lot of time and effort into making this a studio album and i think from that point of view it definitely is that and I'm crossing my fingers that, as Bruce Sugar told me, that "So Wrong for So Long" gets a country gets country play. I he was he told me that they were hoping for that. I think uh, "Standing Still" is another one that could do that too, but because it's got a great uh, dobo uh, solo by Greg Lees. But overall, I think this is a very good album. I I do. Um, I think it's one of his best, and I, I, we keep saying that he keeps improving. But between his singing and the playing, I think this is a wonderful album. I give it an A minus overall. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I know that we mentioned this before on the show, but for anyone curious who who isn't aware, the reason why Ringo had some of these cover versions on this album is because there are two bands here that actually performed at his birthday party uh, in Los Angeles at the Capitol building. And one of them is a band called Vandeveer, and they cover Photograph and Don't Pass Me By with Ringo. And then there's a band, Alberta Cross, that covered You Can't Fight Lightning. So, and Back Up Oogaloo, as as we said, is, is mixing an original recording that Ringo made of the song into a new version. And I think if you listen to the full version of this this new cover... It sounds like he goes back and uses the original recording again towards the end because the vocals sound different. Right. But anyway, um, I think Bruce. I think Bruce said that to me that there's uh, three generations of the song on here or something. It's it's crazy how how they how they mix that. But I think I thought they did a good job with it. I think it really sounds good, and it's, it's a great song anyway. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, Alan. What are your thoughts? Um, I really like it too. Um, as, as Steve said, we've had this for uh, a couple of like, is it a couple of months already? I, th- I think yeah. so. Yeah, they sent it very early, which was kind of surprising. And uh, what one thing that Steve said about it, you know, you get a new Ringo album, you play it, you like it, you say, oh, you know, good for Ringo, that's really fine. And then you know, in in my case. A lot of the time, I might play it again, might not, and then pretty much that's it until it becomes something that we are revisiting for the show, and I have to go listen to it again. <laughs> this one I've listened to probably more than most of his um, recent albums, um, you know, with the exception of like "Time Takes Time," but but it, things like that. I mean, those, those first couple of um, post rehab albums. I listened to a lot more partly because, you know, either I was interviewing him at the time or in one case I, I reviewed it for the times. And, uh, you know, obviously you, you know, you're not playing it casually here, you know, I'm playing it casually and I'm returning to it, which I didn't really do with, you know, the two, 2012 and why not, uh, you know, some of those other recent ones, they were okay albums, but there's something about this, that is so much more together and more assured. Um, as Steve said, the singing is really good. He's in, in fine shape. I really love the country influence on several of the songs, um, and, and including uh, So Wrong for So Long. And actually the three, I don't really think of them as cover versions because he wrote them. You know, actually he... He has writer credits on every single one of these songs, either mm-hmm. alone with someone else. All right. um, New I versions think the cover of old is songs. Some, yeah, 
And, you know, I mean, in, in a way you would think that it's like, oh, man, a re-recording of a Beatles track, don't pass me by. But I really like it. I mean, it's a lot more, I don't find it that similar to the Beatles one. It, it surprised me when that when Steve said it, it wasn't too far apart. It, to me, it's far more relaxed. Mm-hmm. It's far more mm. acoustic. Far more, uh, you know, it's it actually shows a lot of the implications of the song that you didn't really hear in the Beatles version, and the Beatles version has implications that you don't hear in this version. Um, it's it's you know a completely different kind of instrumentation, and he sings it really well. Um, I I really kind of enjoyed hearing it in this version, and the same with um, you know photograph and back off Boogaloo, you can't find lightning. It, 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 it's true. It's not the most memorable of his songs, which is funny because it almost was the out al- the title of mm-hmm. one of his albums. I believe that, you know, um, I think the one that became stop and smell the roses. That's right. Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, he also on this record, he's working with some of the guys from the all-star band, some of the guys from the round heads. Well, Gary Burr, anyway, um, Steve Dudas. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, it just seems like it, it, it sounds like he had a good time making this record. It's not groundbreaking. I mean, it's not going to, like, turn the entire music world on its ear with the amazing fresh ideas. But it's, you know, it's a Ringo album and it's, uh, it's a strong Ringo album. And, um, you know, this. Steve said, I think the playing is the playing's really good. The singing's really good. The songs uh, are generally, I think, pretty high level. Um, the Selassie thing didn't really bother me. It's in a, a sort of a semi ray thing, and there's an association between, you know, highly Selassie and the Jamaicans who revered him. Um, <laughs> but, I'm you know, glad, you, glad you picked that up. <laughs> Well, that's what it is, I think. And um, I believe, actually, I ran into a clip of Ringo talking about some of this stuff, too. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it was him talking about Haile Selassie or whether Haile Selassie, for some reason, coincidentally came up in another context recently. But... Whichever, I mean, if, if if this leads people to look up who Haile Selassie was, that's that's fine. You know, it's sort of right. Expand your horizons. Uh, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I plan to listen to it again. And uh, I suppose if I were going to make a, a Ringo mixtape, um, and quite a number of these songs would be on. I mean, I, I like the electricity too. Um, laughable, I think, was the one track Steve didn't mention, which is. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I forgot uh, to mention that. Uh, go ahead. Political observation. It, yeah, it's just his, his polit- one political observation here, and, and he's backed away from it in interviews just by saying, I'm not political, I can do it in another way. Well, the other way he's doing it is this. Uh, and right. that was co written with Peter say, Frampton. Laughable. With Frampton. Yeah. And he said in an interview that Frampton wanted to be more explicit. Um, right. about what it was about and Ringo said uh, mm, let's not and I think um, and I think it works better that way actually yeah. um, that he that they were subtle about it rather than trying to go heavy handed and it'll be interesting because I mean we all know who he's talking about there's no there's no getting around who he's talking about and I'm you know it'll be interesting to see what McCartney does with his yeah. comment so mm-hmm. well well other comment of Ringo's I thought was really kind of interesting where he, he he's again in the interview I think this might have been the Rolling Stone one recently uh, where he's not naming names but he says you know I said to Peter uh, who knows by the time the record comes out he might not even be there anymore yeah <laughs> right I thought that, I think that was the LA Times I think that was Randy uh, Lewis's oh, interview right. in the LA Times I think but yeah I I, I, I recognize I, I remember that comment too that was funny and if that's yeah. the case, it would be a wise move for Ringo not to mention him. Yeah, because what he's saying is, you know, it, 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 if it wasn't so laughable, it would be sad. Is is really something that you can apply generally to a whole lot of political situations over a very long time. So by not making it specific, he's probably made the song a little more durable. You know, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Okay. So, Ken, what about you? 
Well, let me, let, me say, let me say one more thing. The, the one thing I think I would have, uh, if there's another criticism, I would have probably put the tracks in a different, the first 10 tracks in a different order. Because the drop-off, I think, I, I don't know that I would have put Laughable second. I might have moved it down a little bit long, for, further. But um, that's neither here nor there. I mean, uh, you know. But um, anyway, Ken, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you just brought that up, Steve, because... When I listen to this album, I always feel like if you consider the first five songs side one of the album and six through ten side two, side one is just outstanding, <laughs> track for track. I really do think those first five songs are really great. And I do like the other songs, too, but I just think that, um, you know, it's it's very solid, each of those five songs. I like what you said, Steve, about Ringo's vocals. And I do feel like he's very comfortable with his vocals being what they are. He has a limited range. He knows what he's capable of, but he sounds great at what he can do. And he sounds like he's having fun. And I also love the way that this whole album was mixed. I love how you can hear every single instrument very well. I love the fact that the drums are mixed up. And uh, you can hear what Ringo's doing on on. Uh, on these songs, some, some of those are, some some of those drum fills are are wonderful. I mean, they're really cool. they're really nice. Absolutely, listen to "We're on the Road Again." Listen to his drums there; it's, mm-hmm. it's just outstanding. What I've liked in general about the albums that are post Mark Hudson <laughs> uh, from Ringo is that he has worked with some of the same people time and time again, uh, and he's still working with Gary Burr and Steve Dudas, which I like from the Roundheads. Uh, but it's not like, you know, I, you'll know Peter Frampton's guitar playing in most cases when you hear it. But if you take a song like Laughable, it's not like as a song you would say, well, it's obvious Ringo wrote that with Peter Frampton. Every song sounds like a Ringo song, regardless of who he's writing it with. And that doesn't mean that the person that he's collaborating with doesn't have an influence. I'm sure they do. There's two, two songs that he wrote with Steve Lukather. We're on the road again as one of them, and show me the way. And if you listen to the guitar playing and you're familiar with Steve Lukather, you'll probably think, oh, that, that's Steve, and he wrote that with Ringo. But as a song, as a composition, you know, it's not like you would say it's obviously Ringo and Steve Lukather. They're still Ringo songs. Ringo still maintains his own identity, regardless of who he's writing with. So I really like that aspect of Ringo songs in general, not just on this album, but the previous albums, you know, after Mark Hudson. Laughable is an outstanding track, too. Um, there's a great lead guitar riff throughout the song, which is extremely catchy. Um, Show Me the Way is a really nice ballad that has grown on me. Paul plays a really nice bass part on it. In fact, when he was invited to the session, he was there primarily to play on Show Me The Way. And then he added his bass to We're On The Road Again. So Ringo, I don't think, was expecting Paul to be on two songs, but he ended up being on two songs. Um, Speed of Sound is another one. These are extremely catchy songs. And he wrote this one with Richard Marks. And I'm really impressed with the songs that Ringo has written with Marks in the last few albums, especially not looking back on uh, Postcards in Paradise. Great ballad there. But... Um, Speed of Sound is, is, is a song where you'd hear it and you wouldn't think, oh, that's obviously Richard Marks. Very catchy stuff throughout the first five songs. Standing Still is, a, is another song just like that. And there's a great playing from the Dobro by uh, Greg Lees on the song there. And uh, Ringo wrote that with Gary Burr. Seems like Gary always gets one song with Ringo uh, that he writes uh, for each of Ringo's albums. King of the Kingdom... According to my liner notes, it just lists Ringo as the songwriter. But I did see an article where I believe Van Dyke Parks was the collaborator on that song. And it has a nice reggae sound to it. And I like that aspect of it, as well as the, uh, the sax playing from Edgar Winter on the song. You know, the, the playing from all the musicians is really good. Uh, electricity, you were saying, Steve, it's nice that he gave. This was a tribute to Johnny Guitar from uh, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. It wasn't so much, you know, in uh, the last several albums, he's done an autobiographical song, right? which is about him. But this time, it's really about someone from his past. And I like the fact that he took that approach 
He still mentions Liverpool. He still mentions Rory Storm in it. But it's really about Johnny Guitar and complimenting him what a great guitar player he was. Mm -hmm. And um, so wrong for so long. Ringo is just so natural doing this country music. And um, I can certainly hear country stations playing it. But this song has much more of a traditional country sound to it than contemporary country. But he's right at home on on that track right there and that one's really that one's that one's really grown on me really grown on me a lot um i didn't so much care for it when i first heard it um but i i like it a lot more now Mm -hmm. yeah i just um you know i wish ringo would do a lot more country you know many is the time i said i wish he'd go back and make another country album or even uh, i've even suggested have a country all-star band (laughs) I don't know if that will ever happen in the future, but Ringo loves country music and he's so natural doing it. And this song is proof of that, as are many songs through his solo career. That's a a great idea, a a country all-star band. Uh, That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, he'd be more at home, I think, with a lot of the classic country artists. I don't know how many of them are still around. (laughs) Right, that's the problem. Yeah, um, but So Wrong for So Long, great song. And Dave Stewart, he wrote that with Dave. Um, Shake It Up is a song that reminds me a lot of Matchbox. It's got that Carl Perkins feel to it, three-chord rock and roll. Ringo loves it. He's very comfortable doing that. Um, And Give More Love, the title track, reminds me a lot of Never Without You melodically. I love the message in it. It's more peace and love from Ringo. And Give More Love and Shake It Up written with Gary Nicholson, who's another name that we see on Ringo's more recent albums, who's a country songwriter, who's actually now written, you know, a sizable number of songs with Ringo. Mm -hmm. So um, I especially love, like I said, the production. It's just so crisp and clear and bright. And uh, I I just think the production work was really, really strong. Um, The covers I like a lot. Especially Don't Pass Me By. I do like, um, it doesn't sound anything to me like the Beatle version. Um, It's a much more relaxed, softer version. And I also noticed that when Ringo has done Don't Pass Me By live, he also adds that extra line of Don't Make Me Blue into the song, which was never in the Beatles recording. You know, the extra line of doing that. He's made that, you know, the new arrangement slightly different of the song, so we apply that in the new version here with uh, Vanderveer. Uh, you Can't Fight Lightning is one of those songs that I've enjoyed, but I've never looked at it as being a complete song. It's kind of like, you know, a chorus that gets repeated over and over again. Kind of like Christmas Time is Here Again. It's one <laughs> of those songs that's not really a full song. But it's enjoyable. And, uh, you know, I like it. It's kind of close to the version that Ringo did. Photograph is also a a softer version of the song, which I enjoy. And Back Off Boogaloo, I love Joe Walsh's playing on there. Joe Mm -hmm. Walsh is one of those people that as soon as you hear his guitar playing, you know it's him. And, yeah, obviously I love when George played on it. But I like the approach of what Joe adds to it. And for whatever reason, I don't know what it is. Going back to the old Wave album, Ringo and Joe Walsh are natural together. They always seem to f- that they fit so well together in their recordings. The guitar playing style of Joe, and when they write together, you know, and it's not just the fact that they're brothers-in-law, but um, I've always enjoyed when the two of them work together. So overall, I think this is a very solid album. I'm not going to judge it so soon. You know, I've liked most of the post-Mark Hudson work, and I've liked the production on all of them, and uh, I find this album to be very enjoyable. It might be more consistently strong than some of the other post-Mark Hudson ones. I do look at the albums that Ringo did with Mark Hudson as being amongst the strongest in terms of uh, the actual songs themselves and how strong they are as compositions, as well as Time Takes Time and the Ringo album. But as far as post Mark Hudson, I think this is, you know, a very, very strong album. But I'm not going to, you know, rate it this soon. <laughs> I, I just think that, uh, you know, you got to give it some time. So what do you guys think of my comments? 
I think we, I think we pretty we pretty well agreed with it. We were all pretty well in agreement. I think. I don't think we had any major uh, disagreements. Like I said, the only th I think one thing that I I might have done is change the order around on the first ten tracks. But other, I mean, the songs themselves are great. So um, I'm. You know, I, 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 I just to have some knockdown drag outs. There's, there must be something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Well, you know, for years Ringo has had this mindset of an album is ten songs, usually. <laughs> Although Ringo 2012 was nine, but um, except in the uh, Mark Hudson years. You know, most of Ringo's albums you have ten songs, and if you look at it as ten brand new songs. And then as a bonus, you get these four new versions of old songs. Then uh, you get a little bit more for the money. So I enjoy it. So, Yep. I think, I think it, I, I'm looking at it. would be interesting to see if it does, if it makes any dent on the charts. It probably won't make much of a dent, but because he always jokes about how few people buy the albums. But uh, hopefully it'll get it a little bit of exposure. Well, you know. Whether or not solo Beatles records will sell new releases is a full show to devote to and why they sell or don't sell. So, you know, it, it never comes down to just simply whether it's good or not. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. It's a different time that we're living in. And uh, young people really aren't exposed to this music. And in order for records today to have any longevity whatsoever and any legs... They have to reach young people. And unless young people right. are hearing what he's doing, or in the case of Paul, or any veteran artist out there, in order for albums to be on the charts for a long period of time, it has to be exposed to those people, not just the first generation or second generation fans who have been loyal, who will gradually you know, be dying off. I hate to say it. But um, you know, that's a whole other show. <laughs> so well, why don't we... These th more of these things live than he usually does with his new albums, and there are many tracks here that themselves to that. That um, that I, I, I hope it, this album gets a good representation on his live set. I think that would help. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so too. I hope so too. By the way, here's a little bit of news I just ran across on Facebook. Um, I know they probably they he'll probably hear this when when I when uh, the show is up. But Fred Velez and his wife just got upgraded from their seats in the nosebleed section at the Prudential Center to 20 rows from the stage. <laughs> okay. Our listeners will be so happy for them. <laughs> well, I'm sure Fred is, Fred is ha pretty happy right now. Okay. So, here well, we go. Well, that's another thing. I mean, tonight actually represents, we're doing this on September 11th, the first concert for Paul returning to the U.S. So, by the end of tonight, we're going to know the set list and if there's any changes. Right. So. That's true. That's true. Anyway. Right now we're going to play something special for you guys. And Steve Marinucci uh, interviewed Giles Martin at the time of the new Sgt. Pepper remix and box set. And uh, why don't you tell the folks about this interview, Steve? Well, this was, um, uh, this, uh, was in the Billboard article I did. And I talked to him for about uh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, I tried to ask, you know, a few things that uh, nobody else had asked and, a asked. and I actually did, because I actually got into the question of why Carnival of Light and only a Northern Song weren't included. But I, uh, I, I thought I, I asked him some good questions. Um, and some of the stuff, if you read all through the interviews, you've heard before, but I think a couple of things are probably a little different, especially the last clip where I asked him what the possibility of other albums being done in this, the way they did Pepper was. And since we've, we've heard since that it's probably more likely than, uh, than he indicates here. But, uh, at the time there was no, there was no other speculation. And, he did leave the door open, and and so that's where you can you can hear what he has to say, and then we, and then we'll ha we'll there's something else to mention that we'll talk about after the clips are over. Go ahead, Ken. All right, so why don't we just play the clips? 
This okay. is uh, Steve talking with Giles Martin. Um, how long did the project? Uh, how long was the project in the works? The project was in the works. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I kind of, I kind of started thinking about the extras and stuff in um, uh, April last year, mm-hmm. and then we went in to do the mix in December. And the first mix, the first part of the album took two weeks. You know, we mixed pretty quickly. Um, mix old style, and then uh, and then the revisions that we did took about six weeks. So I don't know. I mean, we didn't work it was on and off. If you think, I mean, I you know I went away and did some more extras work. I guess all that three to four months. In general, what did, specifically did you try to do in the remix, especially as far as your father's work was concerned? Well, it's not actually especially as far as my work's concerned. It's just sort of the band, you know. So I don't sort of you don't know, think of that. Um, but I suppose, well, there's two things. It's the it's the one as everyone knows, as you know, um, is that you know the mono was the one the band were present at. So we tried to adhere to what they were trying on the mono with tape speeds and with effects. Um, you know, the AD thing on John Forrest and Mr. Sky with Dimes is a good example of effects. Um, tape speed, she's leaving home is a good example of that. And then things like uh, fades, like Good Morning with the animals um, being more prevalent on the mono and the laughter at the end of we didn't do that. You know, all these sort of things that Beatles fans cry out for, the experience in the mono. And then on top of that, you know, by using the techniques we use, by using the early generations of tapes, creating a, you know, we get a chance to mix from tapes that haven't been mixed from. And peeling back the layers so, so the listener gets closer to the band. And, and so the intention was really to, I suppose, to make the mono into a stereo as far as the band's ethic and what they want to achieve from their mixes goes. And, uh, and also to, to to bring Sgt. Pepper to a new generation. Was there a, a um, you did not, however, try to do a best of both worlds with the stereo mix and the and mono mix, or did you? Well, you know, no. We, listen, this is we, we mixed it. So um, there's things that you learn. I mean, a good example of the stereo would be. My intention was to put the bass in the center as much as we could. And then little help from your friends, which you could have put the bass in the center. We had that. We had enough track splits to do it. I found that there was a, there's a loneliness to Ringo's voice when the bass is on the on the right pan right mm-hmm. that I was missing when I put it in the center. And Sam actually put it in the right. And I was like, why don't you put it in the center? And he goes, oh, I'm not sure about it. And I was like, come on, Sam, this is what we're doing. And then I did it. And then it was like, oh, uh, Ringo's voice doesn't sound as, as good. Um, so that's one thing, you know, that'd be a stereo thing that, you know, obviously the mono has no panic. Um, things like the edit between Good Morning and, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Reprise on the stereo, I just thought it was better, you know, and I think the fans think it's better. I think my dad got it more right. Did you get any, um, reaction from, uh, uh Paul and Ringo to hearing the remix or, or, the, or listening to the outtakes again? Yeah, of course. I mean, they, you know, if they weren't happy... We, we, they, well, they wouldn't be out, you mm-hmm. know. If, you know, I, I kind of work for them. I always find that question quite interesting because, of course, they have to be happy with everything, and, and, and they they were. I mean, they were kind of really intrigued as what we were doing, and and gave me some advice. And and uh, and, I, and uh, what's fun for me is you sit with them, and 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 it takes them back, you know, and you know, it takes them back to that day they recorded it because it's them, you know. The sound of the record and the whole is the is the noise they made. Um, to be so basic about it. Um, and that's what's so cool. You know, people think it's a lot of techniques and lots of stuff, but you listen to the outtake of fixing a hole, and it's, it's the sound of fixing a hole. You know, that's the sound. They just, they use different textures with Norm and my dad to create this sort of world. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could point to your favorite tracks, uh, both from the remix and from the outtakes, what would they be? Your, your personal favorites? Um... I really like what we did with Getting Better, actually. I think that sounds super cool. I love the fact, you know, Sam had an idea of actually editing the tambours, which we did. Mm-hmm. I said to me, we should let's, let's push things as much as we can. And so um, when there's a drop down section to the tambours, the track really opens up super wide. It's almost like you look for the speakers left and right at you. It's kind of cool. And I kind of think that's what, and then when the bass and drums come in on that track, you hear, you kind of hear, um, you know, you, you it, it was just, it just, you just hear what, you know, what great players they were. I, I love getting better. Um, it wasn't, you know, the reason why I love that is it wasn't really a song, you know, you know, my favorite song off Sergeant Peppers is probably a day in the life. But, you know, I know that one. I've mixed it before. Um, 
And then finally, the outtakes go. There was, you know, there was a cool thing where I didn't know about the hums they recorded in a day in life, and I found that session. It's just fun. It's just like you know, you hear them, you hear them trying stuff and throwing, you know, throwing paint at the walls, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and it's just intriguing how committed they were, and how you can you can sense in that recording, even though it didn't make the album, it kind of wasn't a good idea. Actually, also the, the fun thing was finding the original piano session from from you know when they recorded the, the final piano chord. The same sort of thing, same sort of vibe. Same right. Style. It's, it's this simple. It's just them in a room just bang, banging on a piano. Mm-hmm. And how iconic is that? Why didn't you include only a northern song and Carnival of Light? Um, for two different reasons. Carnival of Light was never meant to be on Sgt. Pepper. Carnival of Light it was never meant to be a record. In fact. It's, it, it's, it's one of those things that fans talk about. It's kind of like Revolution Number no. Nine, um, which is not going to record, but it was meant for the Roundhouse. And I think we should do something cool with Carnival Light, but it wouldn't be. It was never meant to be on Sergeant Pepper. Um, you're, you're referring to only the song being part of the recording sessions. Um, only the song was on Yellow Submarine, and uh, the, the, you know we thought about it, and we discussed it, and we talked about it. But the thing is, is that it's much cleaner for people coming across this album to have the album as it is and you know and with Strawberry Fields and Pen Lane which no one can argue as part of the story um, and to those extras so that's why we that's why we chose to admit those two songs Is there a possibility of other albums getting similar attention to what you did with Pepper although obviously you're not going to be you're not going to you know put out six disc sets for every album but I mean is there a possibility of the other albums getting any kind of backstory like this? I don't know. I mean, let's 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 do this one first and get it out the door, and then and then think about it. Is my answer to that? Um, you know, I, I think I think it depends on how it's received and whether it's valid. You know, I, I I'm really happy with the work we've done. I'm really happy with the reaction that it's had. But um, you know, I'm, I think I think we should all take a breath and then think about the next thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it's certainly been an honour working on it. All right, there you have it. Steve's interview with Giles Martin. What did you think about that, Alan? Um, he said, you know, some interesting things, some this, you know, things that he basically are his script for for this uh, production. The Carnival of Light and um, only a Northern Song thing, I didn't find that persuasive. Yeah, Carnival of Light was never intended for Pepper, but it was recorded during the Pepper sessions and it's a track that everybody who would buy the deluxe box that has been curious about now it, it could very well be if, if bruce spicer is right that everybody bought it and listened to it would then hate it but nevertheless it's you know it's a piece of beatles history that we've never heard it had a performance at the roundhouse um you know so a select audience heard it at the time, and it's it's just one of those missing chapters. Only a northern song, um, you know, the thing is, it was intended for Pepper when George wrote it and when they did it. I mean, that was a song he submitted for consideration. They decided not to use it, but it was part of the sessions. And so, really, it should have been there in, you know, maybe a new remix, but also maybe with a couple of outtakes of it. Uh, So, unless he is holding it back because he's planning to do a Yellow Submarine Deluxe edition, it doesn't really make sense to have not included it. Mm. Uh, I mean, they, they they could have included it and included maybe one or two outtakes and then held the rest for the future. No, I agree with you that they could have easily done something with that. I think, though, the the way they're so paranoid about history, I think that really had more to do with it than anything. Um, and the s- same thing with Carnival of Light. Uh, although, again, I, I I've always I've always said before that I'm not sure I really want to hear it because, like you say, I think everybody's going to hate it, and the reaction is going to be you know, this is horrible, and, you know, social media would just go crazy. So, but I, I think only a Northern Song would have been, a, would have been, you could have made a better case for that. But they I obviously know. did You know, this is such a gray area because, like with only a Northern Song, like Alan said, we don't, we don't really know if Apple or Universal have everything mapped out 
of what they're going to be doing in the next few years, or if they knew that when Sergeant Pepper was released just now, the, the reissue. But you never know. There may be something with Yellow Submarine that might be planned, and then you have to put only a Northern song in there. But, you know, by the same token, you had Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane in this box set. Does that in any way ruin any chance of there being something for Magical Mystery Tour further on down the road? You know, does that interfere with that? So, that's a that's a good that's a good question. I'm surprised we haven't discussed we haven't brought that up before. That's that's a very interesting question. Mm-hmm. So, so you've got these extra songs that you tend to associate with other albums, and you don't really know where to place them. You know, right? <laughs> so well. Yeah, I think they should have been placed in here. Um, now, if he does a magical mystery tour one, which you know would be fine. Yeah, he's now, as you say, he's he's now not got Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane to work with. Um, but you know, there could be there could be a 1967-68, you know, 67 part two, early 68. There could be an album of stuff that goes in between Pepper and the White Album that has all the stuff that ended up on Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour, you know, and that would kind of make sense. And, and, and it would, you know, but, but even then, even then, only a Northern song still belongs in the Pepper Sessions because that's when it was recorded. Well, I mean, we, I guess we can't worry too much about all these things. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, though, you know, we've talked before about Bob Dylan's archival releases and how, for instance, on the 65 set, um, they released all the stuff he recorded, in, you know, 65, 66, all the studio stuff. The same company, Sony, is just putting out at the end of this month a seven CD set of Glenn Gould's Goldberg Variations recording and for the, the 19. He recorded it twice, 1955 and 1981. 1955 was his debut album, and it became like an absolute classic among classical records. Um, it's completely legendary it's uh you know everyone still liked it much more than his 1981 one which is i mean you could argue has more depth to it whatever it's just one of those recordings that people go crazy about and they are giving you every single outtake of the sessions for that recording it's just a solo piano it's just one guy working through the goldberg variations over seven cds and plus they give you a vinyl pressing of the album. But, you know, I, I, every time one of these things comes out, I wonder why can't Apple just do that with the Beatles? They're the Beatles. You know, come on. You know, we want to hear these things. Can be a limited edition. Can be whatever. You know, let's just have it out. Well, the Beatles have always been so protective of this stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's why I was surprised when Sgt. Pepper, when the box set came out, because it made me feel like, well, maybe Paul and Ringo are warming up to this, this whole idea of putting out outtakes, aside from the Beatles anthology. But that was a long time ago already, the Beatles anthology. So we mm-hmm. haven't really had, well, there's the rock band stuff, but we haven't really had, you know, major releases with all the unreleased takes, or even, you know, a lot of uh, outtakes since the anthology. So I was thinking, you know, maybe they're finally coming around to realizing that there is an audience for this, albeit it's probably the most hardcore fans that want to hear this stuff. There is a market for it. And then again, you've also got to deal with the record company and whether or not they feel it's worth their while, you know, to make physical copies of this stuff. If there's a limited number of people mm-hmm. that will buy it. But then again, you might say, this is the Beatles. <laughs> this is the biggest band that ever was. But uh, I don't know. It's, it's, um, I go back and forth on this. I hope the next time EMI is up for sale, which happens periodically, Sony buys it. Because <laughs> <laughs> they seem to know what to do. <laughs> uh, Steve, you want to say anything on this? No, not really. I mean, uh, uh, as far as... I mean, we've we've debated this remix thing so much; it's been ridiculous. I mean, there. What's what's interesting is what came out apparently today. 
by uh, Bob Lefsitz, uh, who some of you may know from the Bob Lefsitz letter. Um, he got a letter from Giles Martin that it has some interesting has an interesting perspective. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it, he uh, he says. First of all, I hope you realize this, the remix project came from Apple Corps, not Universal. I was against the idea. Let's face it, no one has mentioned that Sgt. Pepper sounded bad. The difference was the way the Beatles work is that we're very much behind closed doors. He said, with the remix, we realized we were onto something good, something that was missed in the original stereo, as Paul and Ringo told us, and my dad had mentioned in the past, something that the mono had been taken uh, away by the quick stereo mix that everyone knows. And I know we were talking about this before we started. And Alan, I know you want to say something about that because it, it wasn't. But he says, but in essence, this new mix isn't for you or for me. It isn't so the Socks and Sandals Brigade can discuss the fate on Good Morning, which I, I take as a bit of an insult there, guys. Uh, <laughs> it's about kids putting on one of the greatest records of all times and realizing the music is timeless, just there to be enjoyed which, as we discussed, is not really what it's about. It was about everybody enjoying it. So, because uh, he said, sadly, no kids are going to seek out the mono, the record, the band mixed. So we made a stereo mix using the same care, attention, and process that the band did 50 years ago. Alan, I'll let you, I'll let you take over for that, because I know you were going to have a lot to say there. Well, I mean, in, in, in some ways I said it when we, when we did Pepper, so I'll keep it brief. But basically... Um, this line that he is putting forth and is put forth in the book that comes with the thing about how the stereo pepper was just sort of tossed off as if it was done in 20 minutes. Um, it's just not true. I mean, a lot of those tracks were remixed, you know, 10 times or more. Um, maybe the mono mixes were, you know, spent, they spent more time on them. I think there's a certain, um, learning curve aspect, uh, since the mono, were done first and, and the stereo later, so maybe the stereo took less. But I think the stereo mixes were carefully made. There were a lot of good reasons to do what Giles did, to make something like the mono mix using the multi-tracks that are now available to him that weren't available to his father because of the mix-downs uh, along the way. But the reason given that nobody cared about the stereo mix is just not really true, and it's demonstrably not true. So I, I sort of wish he he didn't keep saying that. Um, and we that's, even, that's all. I, yeah, we even brought up the fact that Jeff Emmerich has been bringing this up, that yeah. they spent much more time on the stereo mix than we've been led to believe or what's been said. Yeah, yeah, it's all getting to be sort of an urban myth, you even as far as Pepper, which, you know, I don't think so. Mm. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, uh, for one thing, that Giles said this was an idea from Apple, because it's kind of been my understanding that when a new project comes out on the Beatles, someone approaches them with it. So this must have been, this must have been Paul and Ringo wanting to do this initially and getting Yoko and Olivia to agree. Mm-hmm. So well, it, it, there could be a level of of discussion that Giles wasn't privy to, like uh, Universal going to Apple and saying, "Listen, Pepper, fiftieth anniversary, you really should do something," and then them mulling it over for the number of months that they may have taken before going to Giles and saying, "We'd like you to do this," you know. So, what the actual truth of who came up with it is, I, I don't think we'll ever really know. Right. Hmm. Although it says there, Giles said it was Apple, not Universal. Right. Giles says that. Yeah. Giles might not have been in the room when Universal went to Apple. You right. Know? That's true. It, <laughs> you know how things work. Hmm. But, but it, is, mean, it, could. <laughs> it is interesting the way that Giles look at, looks at this, that young people, if they want to discover this album, are not going to go hunting down the mono version. So that's why, that's part of why the stereo remix was done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that a little oddly short sighted, too, because, you know, it, apart from the sort of, as Steve says, <laughs> insulting socks and sandals brigade thing, which mm. he's mentioned a number of times, I, I, I don't even understand the image. But 
you know, so that it's not so we can discuss the fade. That wasn't why it was. OK, f- fine. But the fact is, the people who are absolutely guaranteed to buy this recording and, in fact, the deluxe set were these very people that he's kind of deriding. I don't understand that. Right. You know, young may or may not go out and get the new stereo mix, whereas we are definitely going to go out and get it. So why mm-hmm. does our feeling about it not count? Mm-hmm. In response to what you just said, Alan, I think that there's always going to be some concern whether or not any Beatles release attracts a young audience. So mm-hmm. you've got to care somewhat for that audience because you know they represent the future and whatever remaining sustaining influence the Beatles will have. So you can't just go and try to appeal to the older generation that would care the most about this. So there's nothing wrong with, with trying to please both, you know, the young and old. Right. There is nothing wrong with trying to please both the young and old, but there is something probably a little wrong with trying to please the young, saying that what you're doing is not for the old ones and basically deriding the old ones as the Sandals and Socks Brigade. (laughs) So it seems it seems impolite to me, you know, to your actual buyers in the hope that your prospective but not proven buyers might actually buy it. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of that you know what I kind of think that if you do a job that the people who really, really care about the stuff think is great, then that's something to build on with the younger audience. That's a good point. Theoretically, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I agree <laughs> well, with you. You know, that would be wonderful if that was mm-hmm. to happen. All right, so we covered a lot of topics here on the show this time out. And uh, just want to go around the table here and give you folks our contact information, beginning with Alan, how people can get in touch with you. Um, it's pretty easy. You can just get me on Facebook under Alan Cozen or Alan and Remix. And, of course, we all read the show's email, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. There we go. All right. Steve, how about you? Uh, you can reach me directly at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have my own Facebook page um, where I post Beatles and other stuff. Um, I have a Beatles news group, Beatles News and Information. And, of course, we have a Things We Said Today Beatles radio show Facebook page where we post news about the show. And I'll be posting the first link uh, to the show when, we post, when I post it uh, later in the week. Okay. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. By the way, thanks to any of you that kept your fingers crossed or did a little praying for my website because it's back up again. And uh, I did mention a special contest in our last show, which, which is actually going to start this week to win the Weeklings new CD called Studio 2. We have interviewed two of the guys from the group, Glenn Burtnick and Bob Berger, here on this show. And um, it's just a great album of original songs in early Beatles style with cover versions of rare Beatle material. And it's signed, by the way, by all four members of the group. And uh, Brian Ray and his band, The Bayonets, and their CD called Crash Boom Bang. We know Brian from being in Paul McCartney's band since 2003. So you can win both those CDs in a special contest. And um, I've also just interviewed John Murjavi, who is in the Weaklings. He's kind of the George guy in the group. And I wanted to interview him because, like Glenn Burtnick, he's also part of the band Liverpool. And they're the house band that you see all the time at the Fest for Beatle fans. So we get the perspective of a musician that's been in a couple of Beatle bands or Beatles influence bands. And so uh, that's on my website, too, on interviews page four. Okay, so all that's going on on the website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And uh, this has been a great show. Just a lot of stuff that we covered here. So, for Steve Baraducci and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much to all of you for listening. And we will see you next time. Next time.